This is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. And my guest today is a Renaissance man. He does a little painting. He does a little culture exploring. He does a little traveling around. So, and he's now a musician. So please welcome my guest. Tell us your name so I don't butcher it. Thank you. So I'm <laughs> Leif Nilsson, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about you and how you get started, because I find that my audience loves to find out how artists got, get started. Well, is way, way back to when my first, first years? The more we know, okay. the more we appreciate. Well, I stumbled across a photograph. Uh, I don't know which camera I'm supposed to, I think this one's using. A, a photograph of my brother and myself at my grandparents' house when we were maybe four, three or four years old maybe. Mm -hmm. And I'm holding a drawing with a crayon in, one, in, in the other hand showing it to my brother who's on the floor drawing something else. And that, I just remember drawing, drawing, drawing all the time. And they gave me crayons, they gave me nice soft black ebony pencils, mm -hmm. and they gave me um, paper bags, opened up, ripped open, you know, like a craft paper. Sure. That stuff was great. The old paper bags was, had such a tooth to it for drawings. You could get into some nice shading. And as a little kid, that's all I did was draw. Wow. And my brothers were into throwing balls at each other, like baseball <laughs> and so soccer and basketball. And I tried that a little bit, but I didn't really keep my interest. And, and um, so I would always be turning over rocks and looking at things and building little forts and carving things and drawing and got a chemistry set, you know, an erector set and all these experimental things. And my, my first watercolor set when I was about 10, I think for Christmas or my birthday. Sure. And with the real tubes, you know, and a real, yes. real brushes and a yeah. real tin palette. I don't know where that is now. It's probably rusted away, but it was, I lived, I grew up in Old Lyme and on Lime Street, Main Street back then, there was uh, Bill Steves had a, a frame shop and an art studio gallery and arts art supplies, which is where they got the watercolor set. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, a, an idea that you could actually, that could be a job, mm. could be a profession. Mm -hmm. and, and they were also all the, uh, the Lyme Impressionist paintings were all over the place and the, the, um, the um, tonalist painters like Henry Ward Ranger and those guys were all over the place in the town hall and the church and the school and uh, the library. So there was plenty of nice paintings around to look at in people's homes that I knew. And I, so I grew up kind of in an affluent town as a hardworking kid, you know, from uh, like um, Swedish um, sharecropper stock. So we were working all the time and just kind of getting by. And I remember when in the 70s when the gas crunch happened and the economy collapsed and we, uh, we got the job. My father got a couple of jobs as being a custodian or a caretaker for the church and the shopping center. And so wow. we were working all the time, you know, after school and in the summer. And so it was good. I had my own business. I never had a real job. I always had my own business and, you know, made 10 cents an hour up to 25 cents an hour and then finally, you know, $45 an hour or whatever <laughs> over time. And I, um, I just kept drawing and painting and, and uh, went to the Lyme Academy, got some scholarship. I went in to take one class and they said, well, we have some scholarship money. Would you like to go full time? Okay. So I went sure. full time and then I went full time at Middlesex Community College, just studying general studies. And um, I, I guess it was a human, I don't know what kind of a degree I was certain going after, but I only went for a year. Mm -hmm. And um, I did apply to the Hampshire College up in Massachusetts and uh, decided not to go, decided to go travel around Europe instead. Wow, well, sure. And so I did that a few times, long trips, you know, half a year or a little more. Sure. And uh, did a lot of hitchhiking, a lot of trains and a lot of boats and whatever, and, and um, stayed with people I met and with relatives I, I had in Sweden. and. Um, and then eventually, um, well, uh, not eventually, uh, along the lines, I started, would go out and paint, um, I'd go and paint a picture of something that interested me, like a stream or a river or a house or a building or a field. And sometimes it would be a house that somebody owned and I would knock on the door after it was done and say, would you like to buy this painting? Oh. And they would say, how much? And it was like $125 or something like that, and, or $95 plus, you know, another $25 for a frame. And, <laughs> So they would, the lady would say, well, it's my husband's birthday next week. This would be perfect. And, Ooh, uh, entrepreneur so, there. Oh, yeah. yes, so was, an arts promoter. Right, so I started doing that. And, and then I also I did a lot of paintings that didn't sell right away. So I accumulated a lot of paintings so I could have shows here and there in libraries and cafes and um, 
uh, bookstores and um, and eventually I started rent renting out the Essex Art Association in the fall during Columbus Day weekend like for a week or two and um, have a big show and sell I sold a lot of paintings and wow. I developed a following and every year for a few years I did that and then one one day I noticed that the uh, the space that is now my studio in this painting over here okay yes yeah, so let's take a look that. sure beautiful um, that's Go what away. it looks like now but when I yep. when I started renting it in 1990 it didn't have the eyebrow dormer it didn't have the garden in front it was didn't have the ivy it was just a like a garage mm -hmm. um, it had been a bicycle shop a guy okay. made bicycles in there and uh, and it had been a florist shop for a while and then I took it over and made my studio in it and um, so I had regular hours and for, after a couple of years I was able to um, rent the whole house and then a couple of years later buy the house or start wow. buying it mm -hmm. and so I was lucky that it was an uh, owner finance kind of a thing I was involved with a merchants group in town and so they um, they were worried that somebody else would buy the building it had for, been foreclosed on and the bank owned it mm. so it was one of those things and it needed a lot of work which luckily I by hiring some master craftsmen carpenters to work on the house and working with them I learned quite a bit so I was almost like a I took a crash. An apprenticeship there. An apprenticeship, yeah. <laughs> good, so good. I learned quite a bit, and I learned how to you know, measure four or five or seven or eight times and cut once. Maybe cut four or five times too, but not have to like glue any wood back onto the thing. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, but, so I, 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 but cut this thing four times and it's still too short. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and so I learned a lot about con construction and, and um, things like that and, and studying it. And now on, on YouTube, you can learn all kinds of things. So of I'm, course, yes. So I, I, um, when I decided I wanted to put an eyebrow dormer on the roof after when the ants had started eating the whole roof off and it started <laughs> leaking. So, so that's the plan I came up with. And it took me about two years to do, but I you know, took my time and I right. went through a lot of erasers and um, I'm, you know, my, my drawing pads and a lot of math check my math four times, you know, make sure I was right because you have to, every, everything's like add a quarter to the three quarter to another three quarter and then, okay, now that all adds up to 41 and seven eighths. 41 and seven eighths, not 42, 41 and seven eighths. So that's, you know, those numbers have to be kind of respected. Yes, well, precise, yeah. precise. So you got a lot of encouragement when you were growing up from your family. They thought, you know. Yeah, my father was, was encouraging. He He never, he didn't, he never really um, said you have to decide what you want to do with your life. You know, there was a time in seventh grade, I think, where you, or eighth grade, where you could decide if you were going to go to a trade school or mm. continue on with the academics. And I said, well, maybe I'll go to the trade school and learn carpentry, like Uncle, you know, Uncle Eric, and and uh, or Great Uncle Eric. And he said, no, you don't have to do that. He says, stick with the um, academic school. You can always learn that stuff later, or learn it on, you know, on the job. Sure. Um, Get a well-rounded education. He, he um, graduated college with an English degree, and, and he was—I guess—he was qualified to teach, but he didn't like teaching. He wanted to do mm -hmm. you know, hands-on work. So, but he, um, yeah, he encouraged me, and he was the one that he kind of encouraged me when I got back from my first big hitchhiking trip after high school to go down and take a class at the academy. Oh, yes. Which turned into a full-time. Cool. Yeah, thing. schooling for you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yep. And exactly. Studying art history. Anatomy and life drawing were the main, I thought, the main things to, to study in a school because um, life drawing is that you can draw anything because if mm -hmm. you can make a, a, a person look like a person, then you can probably make a tree look like a tree. Okay. Um, right. Art, um, anatomy, so you can learn how the, 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 the body, body works, looks, yep. how, how it mm -hmm. looks, so you can, you can understand what all the, the bumps mean. Mm -hmm. And also understand how s simple mechanics work, you know, right. certain things, levers and rotations and stuff work, hinges, and art history so that you can develop your, your, um, your sense of taste for, you know, for what you like okay. and be able to uh, understand it and defend it. You know, I like this because blah, blah, blah. All right. right. So, so you, when, you are, when you learn art history, though, you're learning about, I would assume, the masters? Uh, yeah, mostly from... Western art because okay. yeah, um, that's our culture. But you know the um, it, it spills over to other kinds of um, art from other cultures if mm -hmm. you open your mind up. But yeah, mostly the masters and and the ma the major um, the major periods of art from cave drawings on up to um, you know well we didn't really get much into modern art. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of the in the 80s when I was taking that that class, they, the art history 
art historians didn't really talk about people that were still alive. Okay. Because it was like not fair for some reason. I don't know. So. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. Academics always make up rules and you yeah, never right. know quite why. Yeah. yeah, there must be some kind of a yes. convention that yes. said, yes, because exactly. you never know what's going to happen to that artist. You know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. You don't want to be in and out of favor. You'd rather yeah. have someone that everybody says, ah, yeah. a master. Yeah, um, was it Turner, W, what's his what, I know who you mean. M. W. Turner, I think, yeah. William, William, W. Yeah, w. William Turner was a, a famous um, landscape painter, and he did things that were very atmospheric. He was one of the first, you know, really atmospheric kind of painters, and, and really abstract, some of his stuff. And um, in the, um, at night, he would go to the brothel nearby and draw nude women right. in, you know, weird poses. And then when he, nobody really knew this, and then when he died, John Ruskin, the, um, the big art critic of the, of the day, um, was entrusted with his his collection of work and had went in and cataloged everything and he found all these volumes of, of drawings and he said I burned them all every every one <laughs> to protect his his image, his, his image. yeah oh my <laughs> god couldn't have a, like a Toulouse Lautrec yeah, couldn't right. have that kind of stuff well yeah so they you know we had that kind of side that that was taken away from us so nobody knows what what it was all about I'm sure everybody would love to there's probably a few of them out there but yeah so. Art history is almost, it's, you know, his story, not her story, or their story. Mm -hmm. It's his story, I guess. And it's right? a white man's story. Yeah, it is. Exactly, exactly. But so I, I really fell in love with the French um, painters, Pizarro, Monet. Um, the Impressionists. The Impressionists. Both those two and, and um, Degas because of their explore, exploration. You know, they never stayed still. They kept trying new things and exploring different mediums and different ways of seeing or recording what they're seeing. And, um, and they became influential. And, and then um, Van Gogh, mm -hmm. he painted in France, but he was Dutch. And uh, Pizarro was actually from the Caribbean, but he went, lived in France. And, um, and then Bonard, um, for his, uh, this is his poetry. So that's kind of like my, you know, I, I'm, I admire the, uh, the Russian um, impressionist painters or, or landscape painters, and they're, they're, they're kind of like, really hardcore draftsman and, and tonal and, and dramatic and really cool stuff. There's one guy I keep looking at on Facebook now, Vladimir or somebody or other, and he's, or Vaklov or something like that, and his <laughs> stuff is just amazing. And, um, and then there's Joaquin uh, Soroya, the, the um, Spanish painter from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and uh, his, his huge horse paintings of horses pulling in um, like barges off the, the or, Boats from the sea right. down in Valencia, and kids running around and with white, but billowing shirts and just beautiful sun, sunlight is what I like to paint is sunlight or light on things. So that's. Um, so tell me, how does something like a painting that you're describing from a famous master, how does that influence your own work? Can you actually have a sense that I'm picturing this work? And that I want to incorporate it. Is it conscious, or is it something much more unconscious? Well, it's both, of... really. It's it's, it, it's. I can later on when I when I wake up after working on a painting, because sometimes you're just in a dream. You're not even there, which is the best time to be painting, because it's it's just like the the flow of the universe is going right through you and taking what you're looking at and putting it on the canvas. And you're not saying, oh, let me make sure that everything is you know right. You kind of go back later and, and re in the revision stage of the painting, and you can straighten things out. You can put punctuation in and capitals where they belong. You know, but <laughs> I like the analogy with yeah, writing. Right. Yes, with the written word. Yes, right. absolutely. And shorten absolutely. a paragraph. You know, wipe out half of the information mm -hmm. or add twice as much more to embellish it. Like like this building, for instance. When after I built it, I did a series of paintings of the um, of the eyebrow dormer. Okay. And. And even while I was building it, you know, before I finished put it all, putting all the panes in, I would make it up, you know, because I was just eager to get it, get, get it going. And the, um, this one, for instance, is, reminds me of, of uh, Cezanne in a way mm. because of the planes. Okay. And so I, when I got it started, I was thinking, oh, yeah, Cezanne, you know, and thinking about the way he would paint forests and, you know, all the, the uh, foliage. And then Monet, you know, of course, is with his way of painting flowers and right. getting the movement. The water lilies, sure, yeah. sure. And his, sure. his garden paintings. And, and Pizarro, you know, because of his, um, those big, he did big, 
paintings sometimes of, uh, of like peasant life, you know, like big barns and people walking around and, and um, so, and then Van Gogh with the way I, I layer the paint and the strokes that I put down. So I, I've gotten into this, I used to paint with brushes like everybody did. And then I, um, I got to the point where I was around 20 years ago, I got to where my brushes were so heavily loaded with paint because I didn't use paint thinner anymore mm -hmm. or, or uh, turpentine. I was just laying the paint on the canvas. Mm -hmm. And so I was dragging talking about oil. oil paint, dragging yes. oil paint over other dried oil paint or into wet oil paint and creating textures that, that were evocative of what I was painting, you know, just to, just to get like um, a scintillation of, of the light uh, in a, almost like a, like, a tap, tap, like a tapestry, especially mm -hmm. when, the, when the brush strokes would, would weave one on top of the other, like a scumble on top or, or a big glob that had a, a stroke to it. And I was using a, I still do use a white called Kremnitz white, which is a lead white. And it, it, when you put the stroke down, it stays. It doesn't, it doesn't melt away or drip off or, mm -hmm. or you know, it, 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 it holds, it's like, it's gummy and it's, it's a stiff white. So it, it the uh, like frosting, I guess. And you then could you say. paint over that. And I, you know, maybe I'll paint over that if I'm making revisions, and so you get all these, these textures that build up over time, mm -hmm. over the course of the painting, even in one shot, in one painting, you know, one day's painting. So I was, I was actually working on the on the, um, the porch in front of the house, had uh, was was all rotten, and the uh, the only thing holding it up was the carpenter ants and they were getting tired so <laughs> so I was helping the carpenters rebuild that you know we made the made all the design de decisions on the fly while we were building it and and so I was helping tear it apart and getting ready and so I'd go out and paint in the morning and come back and work all day and then go back out at the end of the day and paint and and at the end of the day <clears throat> I'd have all these brushes maybe six or eight brushes that I had to wash out all this paint to deal with and so I thought why don't I just use that painting knife that I have <clears throat> It's just one, I used to like to paint with a knife once in a while. Let me just try using that, because one wipe, and it's clean. Right. Right? So yes. the next day I... Because it's metal. Yeah. Next yeah. day I went out with my knife, and I worked on a painting. I started with a brush the day before, and I, for a few days I just kept working on it, and then I had an afternoon, evening painting. I started, started with a knife, the whole thing, from knife from the beginning to the end, and I was like, wow, I like this. Very efficient. A whole new way of, you know, there's... A, it's almost like building because you, you've got these, you know, the big, big foundation boards you're putting in first, and then you can you can put la lattice on top or whatever this on there, and and you can squash it all, you know, you can just plow it all over and start again. It's just very um, direct. So I have a knife that's about this long, uh -huh. you know, about that long, like sort of the shape of a finger, okay, and a little more of a point, and I can. I can do a lot with it. I like it. It's a nice tool. And the col there's color in that too. So you're just I would sit right. Do yeah. You, but you also well, are you are still using oil paint. Oh yeah, oil paint. Yeah. With yes. it, but the knife just is just the application. The application is a knife yes. instead of a brush. Okay. All right. That's yeah. interesting. That's All what right. I've been doing for the last 20 years, well, 19 years. Um, and um, so this painting is all done with a knife. Mm -hmm. And um, and the, which they all are now. Um, what was I saying about that? I don't, can't remember. But so it's more, more efficient. You use up all the paint. You're not wasting a lot well, of paint. Well, and also that guy to your first issue about cleaning them. Since yeah. it's easy to clean. Just one wipe. Yeah. And that same paper towel can last all week. <laughs> <laughs> so what other innovations have you made as you've evolved as a, uh, as a painter? You must have had other changes uh, in your well, style. Yeah. yeah, so uh, around, um, around that time... I, uh, I did a lot of paintings on the river and in the swamps and ponds and, and gardens and, you know. Landscape stuff. Landscapes, yep. Yeah. And, uh, and I had been painting other people's gardens and then, you know, you get there one day and, and they're thinking they're going to paint those beautiful clumps of dandelions, you know, and you get there and it's all been mowed down and all <laughs> trimmed around the trees. And it's like, oh, no. So, <laughs> oh, well. So I decided I'm just going to paint my own garden. So I built my gardens to, you know, to make, to turn into things to paint. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I built this, I put a, made a little fence up in front around a garden plot that I put in, I took, dug up half the driveway and put a garden in it. Right. And um, the opposite of, of the put up a parking lot. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Joni Mitchell. Yeah. yeah right. Let's do that. And so, so, um, so that turned into a whole series of paintings of, of my garden, 
Before that, I had a couple of planters that I would paint, but I made a garden that I grew. And oh, how do you get inspired to do, if, you, if the scene is the same, how do you get inspired to create something that's different? Oh, then? so, so that's, that's an interesting thing. So that's when you stop thinking about it as what it is, you know, its address and it's, it's that, that it's a garden or that it's a fence or it's a, a plant that I planted. And just walk by it and look at how the light gets mm -hmm. trapped in there, bouncing around, bouncing off of things or how it gets interrupted. And they just have to be open and sort of not, not, limit, not limited. So I don't know how many paintings I've done in that garden, but I, I rearranged things and I have plants that bloom different times. So there's like a wait for, sometimes I'll wait for the certain... Certain color to certain emerge because to emerge. that's the kind of yeah. plant or, or right. flower that it might be. Yeah, and there's certain seasons where you know the roses are going to be up and mm -hmm. then the bee balm is going to come up mm -hmm. and somewhere in between the irises are coming up. And, and so... Um, and it, it can, you can get caught into it like, oh, no, not this again. I've mm -hmm. done this a thousand mm -hmm. times. But walking, like one day I was walking past it and I, I just happened to look and I said, oh, my God, I never really noticed the light like this before. And it was a certain time of the year. I can't remember when it was, early September maybe, mm -hmm. at noon. And the way it flooded across the roof and came down and past the, uh, the, 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 po the posts. Mm -hmm. and there's the painting. Right How do I do this? I point. Oh, look. There. Yes, okay. there's the post. Look at that. So... <laughs> So right past the uh, the post, it came flooding out into the into the driveway in front of me. You can see the shadows here, are like high noon shadows. Okay. And so, and just before noon, actually, the, the light is still on the east side of this fence post over here and here, and that on the left east side of the building, there's still some light. And so the, this is like almost like that same day, um, having the light crashing down through there and lighting things up and picking up these yellow flowers against the dark purple of the sh deep shadow back in the, the, the southwestern side of the backyard. And, um, and then seeing, seeing well, how, how far can I push the shadow side in, on, the, on the studio where the, um, the ivy is, almost, to, almost, not black, but a really dark, dark green. So it really pops these pinks and violets without them being lighter than the lightest light. And, is, and, and it, it, you think that, how many paintings do you actually have done of your garden? I don't know, hundreds. Hundreds? Probably, oh, yeah. interesting, interesting. Well, at least a hundred, I guess, but... Uh, and would you put them in categories, or are Well, there's, th 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 I've been painting that garden since 1990, you know, Whatever. different, yeah, right. Yep. We started out with window boxes and, and hanging pots. And um, so that's what, I don't even know, what is it now? 23. 23, 43 years. Oh. No. No. 33 years. 33 years. 33 that's years. still a long time. 33 years, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And, um, yeah, and um, this year I'm thinking, if I get to it, I'm thinking about lowering the, the, fence, the fence a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because the driveway, well, okay, two, in 2020, mm -hmm. two couple years, three years yeah, ago, yeah, yeah. the town decided that they, they needed to spend some of this infrastructure money on like improving our town and so and they even though they told me they weren't going to lower spring street they did and mm -hmm. they and they they say that they didn't but they did mm -hmm. so they lowered it's only a few inches but they lowered my driveway a few inches the road and then my driveway sub subsequently went down so there's a pitch that's really awkward to stand on and i have to l straighten out my driveway now and so my fence is instead of it being this high whatever that high it's now this high Oh, okay. Relative to, yes. you know, so... So you captured the flowers at a different point. Yeah, so, so I want to yes. lower it. You know, so I, it, it's, I'm not looking at so much fence all the time. And it'll, it, it'll be interesting. So I'm not quite sure how, but... So you have uh, now ventured as an artist into different kinds of landscaping, I gather, because now you've become a, a sailor. Is that right? Yeah, I was just about to move into that. So, yes. So um, around the same time that I built this fence, I bought a, a motorboat. This is like 20 years ago. And, um, and it's, um, it became a studio that I would go out and paint on. And I'd go out in the boat and anchor and paint from the boat like a pickup truck. Mm -hmm. Sort of, you know, it was a 19-foot motorboat. And I, I uh, improved the boat, got a new motor for it and a new floor and things like that and, and used it for the last 20 years, almost painting um, all over the Connecticut River and out in the Sound a little bit and mostly over in Seldon's Creek or down in Essex and um, did a, a, a hundreds of paintings of, of the river. So from little, little paintings to really big paintings, like eight feet by 
four feet tall or two feet tall. And then I've always, all along the way, I've kept thinking I wish I had a cat boat because I love cat boats. You know, the mast way up front, the big beamy sailboat. Okay. Not a catamaran, but a cat boat. Okay, I'm not sure I know what it looks like, but okay. that's all right. Well, maybe, um, maybe we can put up a, a slide, a picture. A picture? Yeah. Next. Next. Yeah, that's ah, a cat boat. Ah, there's a there photograph of it. So this is... This is it. Yeah. So this is my cat boat. Mm -hmm. you know, it's an it's a Atlantic City 24 um, cat boat. And it was built in 1980. And it's 24 feet long, 11 feet wide, and it draws two feet and with the centerboard up and like five feet with the centerboard down. It's got one sail, and the mast is way forward, as you can see. Yes. And inside it has a, um, a cabin with a galley and a, uh, a head. So it's perfect for one person. Two people can, if they get out of each other's way, stay out of each other's way, they can, <laughs> they can be comfortable, stay in there comfortably. So I've been keeping it in no ink at Max, Maxwell's uh, boatyard on okay. a, on is a that what mooring. Here? Is it no, this is at Seldon's Creek in okay. Chester. This is, um, time-wise, this is like September or early October last fall. And we'll be going back into the summertime in, in the next photo. Next. Now, this is on Ram Island mm -hmm. in Noank. And that's this little she seashell beach. Yeah. And there, there's my boat anchored way out there. And mm -hmm. there's my dinghy on the left. Yes. My Zodiac kind of thing. Not Zodiac, but a West Marine thing. And there's my easel with mm -hmm. the painting on it that I'm painting that. So that shows my setup. You know, okay. I would take the dinghy to shore. So you don't actually shore. paint on the boat, you paint on the land. I, I paint, the I, so I anchor the boat, I go to the shore, or I sit in the boat. And well, you do sit in the boat. In, my, my little dinghy. Uh, oh. And I paint my boat in, a, in its location. Okay, so you're outside, you're not on the, physically on the boat. Well, I've done some paintings on uh, the boat, too. On the too. boat, too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'm more interested in painting a picture of the boat ah, in its right. spot. So I did a, a bunch of paintings of the boat. You know, I, so the boat's name is Ganesh. Ganesh. Yeah. Okay. It says the spirit of liberty on the back. Uh -huh. It came with that name. But okay, so I have also a, a, a Kubota BX23 tractor. All right. Up in the garden. And that's what I used to make the garden in the front to be able to dig the dirt out and, and do other stuff in the garden and, and stone walls and things like that and shovel snow with it. It's a, it's a eight foot, four by eight foot tractor with a front loader and a backhoe. And it's, it's got a, a diesel, a 23 horse diesel engine in it, um, Yanmar diesel. And so I was taking a lot of yoga classes when I named it Yo uh, Ganesh, which is the um, Indian, Indian from Hindu. god of, of yeah. um, uh, remover of obstacles. Okay. And Ganesh is an elephant. So you've seen that sculpture probably. Yes. But, and Ganesh rides around on a turtle, no, a rat, on a rat. And the rat's name is Dink. So my new dinghy, which I'll be picking up in April, is a, a dire dinghy. It's I'm going to name it Dink. Dink. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ganesh and Dink. Yeah, All right. right. What so, great traveling companion. So uh, this is Ganesh at Ram Island or out of whatever the islands are, these ones, the, yeah. the rocks. And then next, this is back in Selden's Creek. I like how they're all mixed up. This is perfect. So there's, mm. there's a painting. on. I'm standing on a mat of like floating reeds. I'm, yeah. I'm in the water, like up to my ankles. Mm -hmm. And um, there's my dinghy and there's my sailboat Ganesh out by the oh, rocks. Oh, yes, I see it. I see on it. On Selden's Creek. Yeah, yeah. So, Interesting. Yeah. So um, So now you feel like you're uh, in the middle of uh, African Queen yeah. with all the bushes and stuff. Exactly. <laughs> Selden's Creek is a, it's a prehistoric kind of looking place. It's right across the river from Chester. Mm, okay, great. Uh, next. This is back out on um, Fisher's Island. Oh. So Fisher's Island doesn't like people to come onto it, but you can get up to the high water mark. I see, yes. So I sailed over there, and I'm stand the boat is in like two and a half feet of water because mm -hmm. she can, or they can, can stand two feet of water. Yeah, I see, there's your little uh, painting. There's my painting of the painting. The painting of, of the painting. Of the yes. rose hips along the way in the boat. And this is in eastern, I think it's called East... Harbor in, um, uh, forgot the name of the, the beach now, but it's a little beach out there and it's beautiful. The water is so clean and, and crisp. I went. Do you take always the same um, paints 
and your knife, I mean, are they always the same from from location to location? Yeah, it is. It's, it's the same the same easel and the same palette. Um, I I changed in the fall. I I tend to I I uh, changed the palette a little bit because it just seemed darker. A little darker, yeah. So yeah. I went into mm -hmm. a earth. A, I used an earth red um, called burnt sienna, and and yellow ochre and French ultramarine blue. Okay. As my primary set instead uh -huh. of. Cadmium yellow, cadmium red. Brighter, and, and, right? Yep. yep. Or cadmium yellow pale, and uh, which is a, kind of an acidic yellow, and uh, rose red, permanent mm -hmm. rose red, which is a real vibrant. Yes, bright, 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 bright yes. Staining kind of, kind of color. Mm -hmm. And then phthalo blue, mm -hmm. which is a really like robin's egg blue, blue, blue. So there's, there's like different keys or different, there's different, uh, you know, there's different ways to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, right, or there's exactly. nice subtle ways to talk. Yes, you know, so yes. you know, depending on what I'm trying to say, yes. what I'm, what feeling I'm trying to get across. What gave you the inspiration to decide to use a boat as a uh, as as a as the focal point for for the uh, this, these creations? Well, so when I was out painting, even before I bought my motorboat, and I'd go out to paint on the water, like on the shore shoreline someplace, I'd go somewhere where there were beautiful sailboats because I just loved them. I love the mm. way I love the way the sun hits them, and they they pop out of the water and how they or how they they could be silhouetted against you know a bright sky or they can they can just drift into fog mm. you know depending on whatever the mood is and that um the classic shape of a it just makes me feel good just to look at them you know a nice sloop or a mm -hmm. um does it give you a sense of freedom is that what the idea of yeah, being it does. on a boat like that it's a lot you of freedom. You and the boat and the water, and depending on where you are, seaweed, shells, snails, whatever, little guppies and stuff in the yeah. water. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, especially in the summertime when the weather's nice. It's it's uh, just a really nice feeling to be self-sufficient and be able to go. It's like a like you're a turtle, you know. You've got your or like backpacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it has a diesel motor in it. Mm -hmm. And all summer, I think I used maybe six gallons of diesel fuel. Were composed, com compared, composed, yeah, compared to six gallons would would hardly get you through a day in a motorboat. Right, right. It's because you've had enough wind yeah. to take you where you needed to so go. So you have the sail. Yep. Exactly, exactly. So you're you're always there. You know, you never. It doesn't matter. It's like you're not when you're in a sailboat. That is the de the destination. Is just to be on the boat. You mm -hmm. can just be drifting. Right. And you're fine. You know? Right. You're, right. You're, you're you, right you there. own the world. You yeah. can go anywhere that you want. Yeah. So now it's been a dream for years to find a, a sailboat that I, and had to feel like I deserved it or that I or could afford it, you know, time wise and, and uh, money wise. Mm -hmm. And I, I was looking for them at, at, at cat boats for a while, maybe, maybe 10 years ago. And then um, they were all these Marshall 22s or whatever that were, they're five foot something headroom down below. And I thought, this is, I don't really want that, you know? So I started looking at other kind of boats, maybe Cape Dories that had more headroom. More headroom, right. But I didn't like their look as much as a cat boat. So I thought, well, I'll just wait until something, I don't know, maybe maybe it's not right. Maybe I'm just not going to get one. I don't know. And then I thought, well, let me, I had a good year one year, a couple years ago, and I said, let me look, look again. And I found this Atlantic City 24, six foot three headroom. There you go. And it's up on the hard in Warwick, at Appenog in Warwick, Rhode Island in, the, in Narragansett Bay. The couple had to sell it because she had uh, vertigo and she couldn't deal with being, out on being water. underwater anymore, mm -hmm. so they, they were reluctantly selling it. And I went and looked at it, and I fell in love with it right away, and it's like, yeah, got to get it. That's it, that's yeah. it. And yeah. it was reasonable, and it was in good shape. So I thought, okay. You're going to take it around the world, or is it not capable of doing it's, that? Well, if, I guess if you hug the shore, you know, <laughs> it would be all right. But you go, go down to Florida. So I, I was... Uh, I've only had, you know, like a sunfish for a sailboat, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I know sunfish. <laughs> yeah. I used to be on those. Yeah. Yes, but yes. it's the same rig, basically, yeah. basically the same kind of rig, centerboard, a rudder, and a one sail, right? Way up Yes, yep. yes. So, I, uh, <clears throat> I have a friend. That was my youth in the. In, I'm writing about the '60s. Yeah. That was that was part of it. Yep. Yep. They were about the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my buddy um, Darren Keach, who has a, um, he's my age, and he has a um, sit, charter. Sailboat business in in Noank and New London. He's got two boats up here, and he's got a boat down in St. John. Oh, the, in the Virgin Islands. In the Virgin yeah. Islands for the winter time, 
and uh, he's a musician as well, and I've known him for about 20 years. And um, so he said, oh, you got to come, you got to keep your boat in Noank because if you can sail in Fisher's Island Sound, you can sail anywhere. Oh, and I've, right. I've sailed with him in his sailboat, his Ericsson, which is a regular sloop, you know, with a mm. budget, it's got the two sails and, you know, a deep, deep water boat. And um, I said, yeah, you're right, I should. I should get off the river for, river for a while and see what else is out there. And so he was going to help bring me and the boat from Narragansett Bay all the way to no Noank. Because uh -huh. I didn't, I don't even didn't know how to drive a rudder boat. You know, it's a whole different thing. Right. Steering it, and so I thought, okay, that'd be great. And then he couldn't make it because <clears throat> his his uh, his girlfriend, his wife at the time was uh, um, passing away. Oh. And then she okay. died, and uh -huh. so he was like, I can't. Sorry. So I, I hired somebody from the yard who's a like a um, a captain. He's been doing this his whole life. And right. So, and it turned out that he was. Related to some kids that I knew in Old Lyme growing up, the Anderson brothers, and so that was kind of fun. We had a nice 12-hour, 10-hour trip. Mm. So we motored the whole way because we couldn't, if we sailed, we might not make it in time to, before dark to get right. to, the, to the mooring. So we, we motored. But I learned a lot just listening to him and talking to him about how sure, to drive it. Sure, And, and then the next day, after we uh, exchanged cars and everything, the next day I drove around in circles, forward and backwards to get a feel for how, how to use the rudder. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, of course, I, I gobbled up a, a line from my dinghy around my prop and almost crashed into rocks while I was taking it off. But, yeah. So I learned a lot. Yes, yes, I had a trial lot of, and error. I had, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I was fearless, you know, I just did it, you know. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, so I, I finally got it to the point where, all right, I'm ready to pull the sail up. And, uh, and just then, my buddy Darren came over, came, came by and said, you know, how are you doing? And uh, I said, you want to go for a sail? And he says, yeah, let's do it. So he's never sailed a cat boat before, but we <laughs> took off and we sailed all the way over to, to um, uh, Fisher's Island and back mm -hmm. and put the sail down and was like, okay, I got right back onto my mooring, no problem. And so, okay, I think I know what to do now. So the next day I went out and I tried hoisting the sail a couple of times and putting it down and I hoisted it up and I sailed a little bit and put it down and practiced that. And, and then uh, a few days later, I said, okay, it's time to, to take the um, um, the reef out of the sail because when we rigged it from the previous owner, we rigged rigged in a reef, which means it shortened the sail by about two feet. Okay. To, because the winds were pretty stiff Strong. in June, and okay. you know, be, right. be careful yeah. not to have too much sail power. So I took the reef out, and I, I said, okay, I'm going to go over to Napa Tree Point. Oh, I know Napa Tree yep. Point. And I was looking at my navigation thing on my my um, iPad. And it said six feet of water all around. And there's this nice little pond out at the end. I thought, oh, I'm going to go in there. So I took off and I'm ripping on a big reach with a southwest wind, pushing me all the way across. Tide's going out and I'm really beating it against the tide and it's, everything's going great. And then I get up there and I'm like, that doesn't look like six boom, <laughs> feet of water. I hit, I hit the shore. Oh. Not the, sh well, not the shore, but the ground. Yes. And yes. I, I, uh, it's like, uh oh, this isn't good. So I, I got the wrestled the sail down, and I tried to get the boat off of the, off of the, the sand. The sand got yep. the center board up, and, it, and it was, the tide was going out and out. And I got out and I stepped in the water. It was two feet deep, mm. and I pulled on the boat, tried to get out to deeper water, but I just kept getting into shallower water. So well, I'm gonna have to wait till the tide comes back. So I set the anchor, and I grabbed my gear and I went ashore and I. Did a painting of my oh, boat there stranded. You go. <laughs> I never waste a moment. Yeah, yeah. because the light was great. Right, and then, right. and then I got back on the boat and waited till about nine thirty, till the tide came up enough to motor out to the, to the um, anchorage. And then the next day, realized that the the, uh, the centerboard had bent a little oh. bit, and I and was uh, I couldn't pull it up all the way. So mm -hmm. I called I called my uh, insurance, and they sent a, somebody out. Somebody out, and mm -hmm. so it took a couple of weeks to get that straightened out. Meanwhile, I painted on land, and I <laughs> stayed on the boat on shore, and uh, for a week or so, and and um, met some different people and whatnot, and then, and then Just chalked it up to an adventure. Yeah, it was a part of the adventure, right. and then it was like a camper yeah. at that point, and and then, then I got back out sailing some more and uh, and f painting all over the place, and then and then around September fifteenth, I said, I think the the weather's good this week. I think I'm going to bring, a, bring uh, I don't know if it's a her or a him, so I call it a they. Okay, yes. I'm going to bring, or them, 
bring or it. <laughs> All right. It. I'm going to bring it up to uh, the Connecticut River, up to Chester, because I had a mooring, I mean, a, a slip up there all summer for my motorboat, but I never used it. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go. So I took off, and I took a few days to get up there. And on my way, because I would have to haul it out, or get it off the mooring in Noank by October 1st. Okay. So I only had two weeks anyway, so right. I might as well get up there and paint some of the foliage while still there and take some trips down to watch this, the swallows at, at Cavs Island. And so I brought some friends down there and had some fun doing that. Anyway, on the way up, I planned it. That it was just perfect that I would, by the time I got in the sound heading towards the Connecticut River, the, the east wind was pushing me. And then by the time I turned right to go up the Connecticut River, it would turn to the south and push me up the river. And I was just going to sail all the way up to Chester, you know, like 12 miles up to Chester. So I started going up the river. And I realized that this a Saturday afternoon, like one o'clock, and these big 40-foot boats were going by me, flipping these four-foot wakes at me, and I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> this isn't good. And um, when you have a, your sail out like you're reaching like that, and if it starts to, if it, it wants to, um, what's it called, jibe on you, it could be, it's a big sail. Mm. It go all the way around, and then come back to the other side and go whap, and then Usually it wants to do it again, mm. so I have to grab all those lines and sort of hold it tight. And but luckily it was a light wind, so I wasn't getting smacked around. But then it was starting to go back around, and I'm heading up towards a red can on the right. You know, keep that on your right, coming back. And I thought, oh no, I'm a little too close to it because here comes the sail. It's going to whip around and it's going to go and smack that can. And just then a wake made the boat do this, and then back up like this, and I'm right up over the can. Mm. Went, okay. Lesson number 173 from today is <laughs> stay at least at least a boom's length away from a can because you, you know you never know what's going to happen. So I got up to the the mouth of Seldon's Creek, which is about eight or nine miles up the river, eight miles, eight and a half miles, and all these big boats are still going by me, and they're all like waving at me, and I'm <laughs> I'm not waving at them because <laughs> you're not happy to see. <laughs> I'm them. not happy to see them. Right. So I said, I'm going to go up through the creek. Tide's still coming in. And I, at, the, at the worst, I'll just take the sail down and, and just motor through. So I got in there, and, and it was still wind. And I had the motor on just in case, but I was in neutral because I was still sailing up the creek, which is unheard of. And I sailed. I was sailing along, and after a little while, um, oh, maybe we should do next. Next? Next photo. There we there go. We yeah. go. So is this you? This is me in the creek a couple weeks after I sailed all the way home. But I was sailing up the creek, and um, somebody, I don't know, I think we took it out of there, but it might still be in there. That somebody took a picture of me mm -hmm. sailing up the creek, and they sent it to me, so I had that in here. I don't know if, it, if there was room in, for the photos for it, but I got all the way to the, to the north end of the island, and that's notoriously shallow at low right. tide. It's, right. uh, people get stuck there all the time. And... Um, and I'm sailing past this campground called the Cedars, and there's these two ladies there. Ladies, I'd say, because they're older than me, so they're ladies, right? Yes, of course. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they look like sisters, and they had a couple of tents, a tent set up, and they're looking out, and they just, they just smiled and started laughing and pointing at me, because there I was in <laughs> sailing in, this, in a big, fat sailboat up through the Seldon's Creek. And I got out into the river and sailed halfway across the river, lowered the sail, and, and went up to my dock and docked. And um, so this couple weeks later, I'm exploring in Seldon's Creek, driving the boat down the creek and sailing if there was wind and figuring out how I could paint sitting in my dinghy. <laughs> so, Which moves. It doesn't stay. Yeah, but there's yeah. not a lot of wakes. Okay. You know? yeah. right. And I didn't have an anchor for it, so I had to just stick the oars in the mud. All right. And, and every now and then I'd row myself back in to the, to, up onto the shore. All and right. that's a little electric motor that I hardly used, but I got it just in case. Yeah. Um, what about next? Next. Oh, oh so this is back, yeah, there we go, back and forth. So this is back when I was painting on Ram Island. Mm. And I'm wearing my old short, the, my car hearts that are just about falling apart. And my straw hat that I got in Santa Fe, New Mexico, 40 years ago. Right, of 1993. course. 1993. No sense in getting rid of a good hat. Right? And, yes. Um, but you are nice and tan. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I took that, I just got lucky with a shot with my iPhone. And that's my sailboat in the background. So okay. I'm painting a picture of it. Yeah, yeah. And next, well, there's me painting on the boat in, uh, at okay. Maxwell's. Next. And there's the 
the sail, me sailing up the creek. Wow. Um, Interesting. So you can see that nice gaff rigged sail. Next. Oh, that's, uh, that's it. Again. That's you. I guess that's it. Okay. Yes. So well, that that's fascinating. Absolutely. So you not only are you a painter, but you are an experienced sailman. So you can go ahead and take a yeah. rescue people who, uh, who whose boats turn over. Yeah, right. Get out there in that sailboat. So now I now up. I'm ready to start taking some adventures that I've had that that summer of learning how to use that boat. Okay. And, so uh, now where would you like to go? Well, I want to I want to sail over to Long Island. Okay. Okay. And yep. actually go hang out there for a couple of days, like maybe, um, you know, poking around Shelter Island and all that over mm -hmm. that way. And I want to sail um, back to Napa Tree, but going the right way. Mm -hmm. And I want to first, I, once I get back to Noank, I want to circumnavigate Fisher's Island. Okay. And that's going to be a trick. And, um, and then I'm going to try to get to Block Island, maybe up into um, Narragansett Bay, go to Newport, mm -hmm. and then wound up to Black. Block Island, get out to um, Nantucket and mm -hmm. uh, Martha's Vineyard, do that kind of a trip. And, and then I also want to do more on the Connecticut River, and I want to be able to sail up the Sound, up maybe all the way up to Greenwich or to New York, mm -hmm. just to do it. And, um, just for this, yeah, yeah, right. And my girlfriend's got it, her house is in Clinton, her, where her practice is. She's a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. She lives with me in Chester, but um, there's a, she lives near the beach. And uh, in a historic district kind of area, and um, there's a the beach, the town beach is pretty cool. And there's a friend of mine, I think she just still does it. She does an open mic on uh, or a live jam, like jams on the beach. Okay. Beach jams. Well, you on, know the Westerly is famous for that Mesquamacut. Oh. In the summer. Yeah. Has a blues. Ah. On the beach. Yep. Once a week. Oh, cool. For weeks. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a check that out. Monday and Wednesday, different kinds of music. Mm -hmm. Um, blues, and I can't remember what the other one is. Uh, and sometimes during the course of the summer, they'll get somebody who was at one time famous, mm -hmm. uh, but still can sort of sing and yep. always can play. Yeah, right. And they'll cool. invite them to perform. So this thing on the beach in Clinton is a lo just a local, like, yeah, small time people just getting together yes. and jamming on stuff. Yes. So it'd be fun to go in and anchor there and go play there, you know, cook out on the boat, and then... Um, what instrument you know, do you play? I play the banjo. The banjo, okay. Yeah. Yep. What got you interested from painting to the banjo? Well, I always played guitar oh, for a okay. while, and then um, somewhere I kind of left that out, and then about 20, 22 years ago, I started playing the guitar again, and then somebody said, you know, you sound like you play like a, like a banjo, so she gave me a banjo for Christmas, and I've just been playing a banjo ever since. And what's your group? Do uh, you have a name for your group? Well, my group that I've had is called Arrowhead. Arrowhead. Yep. This is, uh, um, but there's uh, my, the, the co-founder of that group and myself, and, or he is just has uh, had bad, a terrible operation, and uh, so it's, he's been out of it for a few months. So we're just oh. waiting for him to come back and we'll okay. see what he does. And the other rest of the band has sort of got other things to do. And mm -hmm. so now I'm... I'm adding some other members in, and we're starting up again. And, and I'm also working with another group. I call them Eric and the Hearing Aids. <laughs> You're looking for that kind of uh, clientele. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So that'll be that. That's fun. We're we're doing some uh, more bluegrassy kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. And what other um, instruments are in the band? That one has a. Uh, in my band, we have uh, my girlfriend plays the cello. Okay. And, we, and then the we electric have a cello or the cello? Regular cello. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, and, uh, there's a guitar player okay. right now. But we did have a stand-up bass and a couple of guitar players and the cello and the banjo. Interesting. And yeah. then the uh, Eric and the hearing aids, is uh, <laughs> there's a guitar, a bass, a mandolin, and now banjo. Okay. So it's a, everybody plays a different instrument, so it's pretty good. That's cool. And a harmonica player. Uh, yeah. Mark, okay. And, and he's the lead singer, too. Um, all right. Singer. Yeah. 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 Are, we, are we doing originals or covers? Um, that band is more traditional stuff. Mm -hmm. And my band, Arrowhead, we did originals okay. and oh. covers. But okay. I, I said, no, when we're playing at the gallery, um, we have to play originals because I don't want to have, I don't want to be cover bands. And I don't want to deal with BMI and those people. Okay. And so I have a concert series in the garden um, throughout the summer, every Saturday night uh, through from end of June to end of September. Mm -hmm. I have uh, local bands or bands from as far away as uh, South Africa or Florida. Wow. Or, All right. You know, that, that come and play. Lately, it's just been Connecticut bands. And uh, it goes from bluegrass to 
cool jazz and rock and roll in between and, and some, um, some classical. And a lot, most of it is original and some of it's traditional, but there's no covers. Great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So in that's your musician life, mm -hmm. that's your painting life, you had your sailing life, and now you're an arts promoter. Tell us about what your yeah. other venture is going to be. Well, it's just, it's just because I, I have art friends, you know, like now it's writers for some reason that are <laughs> showing up. And so we have a, um, a book signing and, um, well, for the first Fridays that I've had, we mm -hmm. have in town, um, which camera is it? That one, I guess. The first Fridays in Chester are um, celebrated by having, the shops are open late, like five to nine or eight o'clock. And um, a lot of the art galleries have different shows and, and like opening receptions. And so traditionally I would have a band playing or one of my bands playing. And, and, um, and then I realized that I'm, I'm kind of just not as connected to the people that are coming in as I'd like to be. Even though I, I would break, out, break away from the band and go talk to people, uh, you know, they, they always felt like they were inter interrupting me. Right. So I thought, well, you know what? Once, once uh, um, Claire Smith has been writing this book called um, Georgiana Like So Many, and it, the big part of it has to do with the, uh, the Chester Hotel, which is my house. I'm just going to quickly show this because this is interesting. This is my, my house. The old Chester Hotel around 1900, before a couple of fires took the uh, the, the, the height down to a one and a half story, <laughs> and uh, it was the hotel for um, people from way out west, like in Ohio, that would come to Connecticut to buy things from the from the factories that made like auger bits and picture hanging hooks and whatnot mm. stuff that they could sell in their hardware stores. So there's a bar big part of this book is about the Chester Hotel back in the 1880s to 1903 when Georgiana ran the, the hotel and the saloon, um, or her husband ran the saloon, and it was um, every year for quite a, quite a few years it was towns could vote whether they wanted to be a dry town or a wet town. Mm -hmm. So the saloon never knew when, if it could be open <laughs> after October. So that was an interesting book signing, and, and while that was being planned, um, Mike and, um, and Judy showed up with copies of their books and said, here's, because we, we, I met them back in the fall, and they said that they would, sure, you know, they'd like to do a book signing or something, and so we're doing that the next first Friday, which is... Um, March the 3rd. March the 3rd. Oh, right. there's the camera. Okay. March the 3rd. March the 3rd. Mm -hmm. which 5 is to the, 8 p.m. From 5 to 8 p.m., right. and... At the gallery itself. At the gallery. Yeah. And there's one more, one more artist uh, or author who will be there. Um, she's a, she couldn't. I didn't get a copy of her book yet. So her name is Rose Young. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And the slide. And um, she'll be reading from her her mystery novels. Right. And you can find out more information about these authors and the, and the events that I have in my studio from my website. And it was, that was, uh, maybe that slide can go back up, my contact information. Yeah, great. The bottom line is my website. And so take a screenshot of that or, or write it down. And I have, or just call me at my phone number. And um, we'll be, I don't know if I'll, how many more book signings I'll be having this year, but we might do the George Ann one again because that night was, uh, that we had this one was about seven, minus seven degrees. And, and uh, <laughs> mostly her, her friends and relatives came. Yeah, and, a little uh, too nippy, yes. Yeah, exactly. so we might do that one yeah. again, maybe in April, just to. Yeah, you would like to do it today when it's 60 something degrees yeah, in right. February, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, yep. exactly, exactly, um, exactly. So my goodness, didn't I say, didn't I open this up by saying you're my renaissance man here, you, the, the artist? Well, so... The, <laughs> the, the artist, so, the musician, not an author, but an arts promoter. So you're doing all that stuff to keep, uh, to keep us all happy and keep Chester... Yeah, keep the interest in love. I mean, life is so interesting, you know, if you allow yourself to get, you know, caught up in the rapture of it, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And not not so, be afraid. Yeah, so I urge people to, to come on Mar uh, March the 3rd. Go up there to Chester. Chester is a, just an incredibly lovely little town uh, nestled there in the, right by the river. It's, um, it has a lot of things to offer, beautiful old houses. You can just take a, just take a drive and you'll see what, what lovely stuff there is. So it's a good excuse to get down to Chester. Uh, 
March, uh, the sun probably won't set till close to seven, so you'll get a chance to, to be out there in the, in the clear weather. Nice sights that you can see. Check out the studio, check out the gallery, and we hope we, uh, we, hope we see you there. I was gonna be there, but uh, other commitments have kept me away. So go ahead and check it out, and then you can contact me and tell me what did you think, and I can get your, get your votes on what you liked and what you didn't like. So this is a wonderful pleasure to see you. Thank you for having me. And have you on my show. And I wanna remind people, I know I take, talk about it all the time, I am giving a creative writing class. It's completely free. It's at the, at the Pawkatuck Neighborhood Center, which is on the Pawkatuck Westerly Line there. It's uh, Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. As I said, it's free. I give out homework, but I don't grade it. So you can have a heck of a lot of time. We uh, chit chat, we compare each other. We did have one of our uh, uh, writers get uh, published in the Mystic Times. So there is hope we can give you this kind of soft hearted but critical criticism that'll get you perhaps in, the, in uh, also published in the Mystic Times. So I wanna thank you all for coming and watching. I hope to see you uh, sometime in the future. And do go to the gallery on March the 3rd and uh, do come and join us another time. Thank you very much.